They shape their lives around the things that they have seen by faith. Amen. The Thessalonians, when they saw the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, they forsook their idols. So now you know why some men don't, and now you know why some men do. Some have seen Jesus and some haven't. That's what faith does. And why do they do this? Because the true knowledge of unseen realities beheld by faith makes our service to God reasonable. It becomes reasonable to do whatever God asks you to do. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Well, if you can see Christ, that's perfectly reasonable. See? Seek the things which are above. If you've seen those things, that becomes perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Or maybe here's something like, here's something Peter said. He said this, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, mm -hmm. in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, yeah. and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, mm -hmm. seeing then. Yeah. Don't presume you have. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this? Because if you haven't seen this, there isn't any then. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, I like this. He doesn't immediately go to the deeds. He goes to the manner of the people. What manner of persons ought ye to be? Huh? Because after that desolation of the world is the judgment. What manner of persons ought ye to be in view of the fact that the earth is passing away? Is this really where you want to place your investments is in the things that are going to burn up. But men do it all the time. We are astounded by the kind of decisions people make. Why? Because they don't have faith. That's why they do those things. See, when a man has faith and he sees these marvelous realities, serving God is reasonable. And yet, walking by faith is not any more automatic than walking in the flesh. I don't mean walking in the flesh like that. I mean just taking steps and walking. It's something you got to do intentionally. Doesn't just happen. And that's the way it is in the spirit, too. You have to walk by faith intentionally. And the only way you can do that, brethren, is to be stirred up. Your faith has to be stirred up. We have to come together and stir one another to love and good works. Faith has to be stirred up, and it's stirred up by reasoning. Yeah. By reasoning about this. And so that's what Paul's doing. I'm going to appeal to the faith of you, brother, at Colossus, and I'm going to personally appeal to the faith of the brethren here to be like your master, who himself is just, he's just and equal. And I'm going to encourage you in the light of the things that I show you about God as our master to go and do likewise. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you have a master in heaven. So that's what we want to look at this morning. Now the Colossians, unfortunately, they were, they were being subjected to some kind of other gospel, some kind of gospel that was rooted in human philosophy, and there was a danger that they would be turned aside. The danger of another gospel is that it causes for your faith to diminish. And as soon as your faith diminishes, all these realities that you've seen, they begin to go away. And what happens then? Pretty soon you find yourself without the moral power to conform your lives to the things that you've seen. Something as fundamental as you have a master in heaven can get away from you. It can get away from you. You have a knowing that you have a master in heaven. I don't know if it had gotten away from the Colossians or not, but if you get weak enough, this will get away from you. Okay? You have a master in heaven. So let's look at that. We have a master in heaven. This isn't the way it ought to be. This is the way it is. Okay? This is the way it is. All men have a master in heaven. We do not want this to get away from us. Jesus, when he was washing the feet of his disciples, which must have been somewhat of an awkward thing for the disciples, quite humbly that the master would do something like this. But after he had sat down, he said, now you call me 
Master and Lord. And ye say, well, for so I am. That is what I am. Now, they didn't say, you say, well, because now you, you have asked me to be a master. Well, I'm going to master you, though. Some people had that kind of view of Jesus, that if you, you can make him Lord. You know, Brother Gibbons dealt with this a lot. No, you said, well, because you acknowledge what already was. I am your master. You have said well by acknowledging the truth and reality of these things. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. So he's going to correct this right out of the shoes. He's going to correct this about his disciples. Remember, they were the ones that were talking amongst. They had known that they were receiving some special favor from heaven. They knew that, see? They were receiving things that the other masses weren't getting. They were receiving all these explanations of marvelous things that Jesus wasn't giving to the multitudes. In fact, he, sometimes he'd tell them, he says, it's not been given to them, but it's been given to you. So they knew in some sense that they had, there was, there, there's some kind of a prominent place in the kingdom that they had, and so they were talking to one another about, about greatness. Which one of us is going to be greater? And so Jesus tells us what greatness is about. It's about you knowing that you have a master in heaven and knowing that that master in heaven at this present time is washing your feet. So go and do likewise. Amen. Brother, you can't let this truth of having a master in heaven get away from you. Amen. In a moment of time, this reality and truth of you having a master in heaven can get away from you, can get away from you. Paul had to deal in the church at Rome, Paul had to deal with some fractions that were taking place. There were some brethren who had come far enough to realize that all meats could be taken. We give thanksgiving to God for these things. It's all sanctified. We can take it all. It's okay. But some brethren that were weaker didn't have this view of things. And there were certain meats, you know, that they felt consciously they couldn't take. And so it caused frictions. And there was judgment taking place among the brethren. So here's how Paul dealt with this. He said, who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. You're judging somebody else's servant in these matters. This had gotten away from them. You have a master in heaven. Not just you, brethren, but look around the room. These brethren have a master in heaven, and it ain't you. And it's not me. Hmm? It's the master in heaven. So when you, when, when, I'm not saying by this, and I'm glad what Brother Mike said this morning. We're not saying by, like, by this, like, you don't make judgments. Don't make judgments. Don't make judgments. Well, that's a foolish notion. That isn't the truth at all. But when you do make your judgment, you make it in view of the, this fact that they're not your servants, they're his servants. They're his servants. See? They belong to him. This is why Paul refused to take dominion over the faith of some. They belong to him. And if you make a judgment that isn't right, now you're in contention with the master because these servants belong to him. They're his. I'll tell you, these are some sobering realities, but this is good to know. We do have a master in heaven. How about men, when men might provoke you to do things that the master in heaven would be provoked to offense by? That price that some of us have paid to come to this assembly, other men have tried to have dominion over our faith, told us how foolish it was to do things like this. Well, you're just following the preacher. These kind of things. Someone needs to tell them, we already have a master in heaven. And he's there. He's not here. Amen. He's not in the earth. Our master isn't men. Amen. Not in this sense. It isn't. So Paul said, you are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Some of the Corinthians had lost this truth that they had a master in heaven. Their lives were being modified by men rather than God. The Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees had this kind of a trouble. And Jesus told his disciples that they sit in Moses' seat. And whatever they say, listen to them. But in the doing, that's another matter. Because all their works they do for to be seen of men. 
That's why. See, they're not really motivated primarily by their service toward God. They're being motivated primarily by the praise of men. Somehow this truth that they had a master in heaven had gotten away from them. And so remember some of the things that they did. It said they make broad their phylacteries, you know, these prayer boxes and things they'd put on their head, you know. They go to the morning prayer session and have these things on their head. They would enlarge it. I don't know how they did this, whether they enlarged the straps that they put them on their head to or just enlarged the box itself. But they were giving off this notion that they had, boy, they had this great service to God. Everybody see this service I have to God? Those kind of things they were doing. Not to be seen of God, to be seen of men. And it says they enlarged the borders of their garments and they loved the upper, uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats and the synagogue and greetings in the markets and to be called rabbi, rabbi. But Jesus said, be not ye called rabbi. In other words, they liked to occupy the place of the master. That's what they wanted. Call me rabbi. Call me rabbi. Now, you understand Jesus isn't saying here, don't ever say that you have something to say and are a teacher. You know he wasn't saying that. He wasn't saying that. He's talking about this place that God occupies. Hmm? There's one master, and he's in heaven. And he's not a Pharisee, and he's not a scribe. And so he says, be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. See, we're not even masters over our brother. You're not masters over your brother. Not by any means at all. See? You're not. We have one master in heaven. In other words, we follow our brethren to the degree that they follow our master in heaven. They follow Christ. We're able to follow them. See, this was the pride of the scribes and Pharisees. To not acknowledge the master in heaven. And it is, the, it is brethren... It is the root of all pride to not acknowledge that we are in subjection to someone else. I'm astounded at the kind of proud sayings that are going forth, especially from this country in which we live. Things like, it is my life. I can do what I want with it. Is it? Or do you have a master in heaven and your life belongs to him? Amen. I don't even like the notion, my life, unless you're rendering that unto God, knowing he gave it. You can't tell me what to do. Ever heard that? Heard someone say it? You can't tell me what to do. I was going through Walmart yesterday, and I heard this little, this kid, this little girl. I think she was a girl. She was like demon-possessed. My goodness. In a cart with three adults around her. Three adults. That could have took her out. And she's going down an aisle saying, I want to buy a movie now. That little chill child is already being conditioned at a young age to not live with a master in mind. And those parents ought to be beat. If they don't want to beat their child, then we'll just beat them. It's horrible, people doing stuff like this. They're not, they're not raising their children knowing that they themselves have a master. And so they're not raising their children to live under the rule of a master and to be subjected to someone else's rule. Yeah. I'll tell you, God's the master, yeah. and what he says is going to go. Yeah. I'll get to that here in just a little bit. <laughs> Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Remember those words? Whoa. Shouldn't have said that. So much for Egypt. Yeah. There's no God. We hear that today no God. You, you, you really believe those things? God's dead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All of these are prideful statements from people that don't know they have a master in heaven. How about this one? Here's Israel's reaction to a divine judgment that was leveled against them. God brought destruction. And you know, if destruction's in a city, who's done it? Nature did it, right? Why did nature do it, brethren? Because God was in it. Isaiah 9, 10, the bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Huh? Yeah, our city got destroyed, but we're going to come back stronger. We're going to be bigger. We're coming back better. We have heard that kind of talk 
since 9-11 and since the tornado that hit Joplin. And we have heard elected officials actually quote this very text in giving that kind of promise to people. Yeah. We're coming back. Well, you know what happens, brethren, when the first hammer doesn't work? God gets a bigger one. So go ahead. Build your bigger houses. And go ahead. Get your better storm shelters. And God will send an EF-10. Because if you don't learn the first lesson, he'll send another one. And if you don't ultimately learn it, the day of judgment is going to be the ultimate E-1 million tornado. That's going to take it all away. This is the way God is, brethren. People don't know they have a master in heaven. Somehow they've not seen this. Job 41, 34 says, He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over the children of pride. He beholds when men lift themselves up into a high place. He saw, he saw Satan when he was lifting himself up. That didn't take him by surprise. When he said, I will, make my, I will be like the most high, God knew it. He was out of heaven in a lightning shot. God doesn't have any troubles humbling the proud because he really is the master that is in heaven, see? Which means this, the earth really is subservient to heaven. I'll tell you, there is no master on earth that doesn't have a master in heaven. Amen. Jesus is king of kings Amen. and lord of lords, see? God has raised up great and powerful men. Like Nebuchadnezzar, one of the most powerful, just in the flesh, one of the most powerful men that we've known in the world. And yet here's, here's something he said, and this truth got away from him. Your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. See, he's king, he's king over the great men of the earth, the men that, so to speak, have control over the earth. He is in control of them. Remember, this truth got away from him. This truth got away from him. And so we had to go out and eat grass for seven years. Right. You remember why? Mm -hmm. He told him exactly why. Seven times shall pass over thee till thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. I'll tell you, if he's a God of gods, he is most certainly a master of men. Come on. Amen. Knowing that you have in heaven a master, a master. Now, who is a master? Who's the master? He's the one that's greater. That's what a master is. He's the greater one, see? No master is less than his servant. He's the greater one. The master is the greater one. In John chapter 13, verse 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. It's not that he shouldn't be, he isn't. Or else the Lord isn't Lord, period. Right? That's why he's Lord. Neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. See? He's the one that calls the shots. He tells you where to go because he's greater. See, God tells us what to do because he's greater. He's greater than we are. He's our master in heaven. He's greater. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that he is indeed that. Job's friend said to Job, I know this was a misapplication to Job, because Job just wanted to understand why these things were happening. Because he had lived uprightly before God. But now his friend said, God is greater than man. That's the true saying. He is. He's greater than man. Mm -hmm. He is. Jethro, remember when uh, Moses came back out of Egypt after the destruction of Egypt and gave this report to Jethro? Jethro said this, now I know. I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. Mm -hmm. He judged all their gods. See? And brought him down and brought his people out against the will of Pharaoh. He did it. He's greater. Greater than all gods. He is indeed that. Jesus said one time this, my father which gave them me is greater than all. He's greater than all. Amen. See? There are some masters that are greater than other people. So they, are, they, they occupy the place of a master. But then there's the master. And he is greater than all. It's good to remember that when you're in the time of temptation, see? No man's able to pluck them out of my hand. If you're walking by faith, God won't let you be plucked out of his hand because he's greater than all, than all. 
I'll tell you, brethren, I hope this comes across because I'm having to deal with two different kinds of audiences here. I'm having to deal with a people that have some kind of a position about God that doesn't allow for God to be a master. God want, We've said this this morning, God wants to bless your life. And maybe at the service that sounds kind of good, but maybe it's more self-centered, like Sister June said, than men think. And so it doesn't allow for God to be master. How about his life and what he wants? And how about you don't have a life? Huh? Forget high esteem. Have the lowest esteem you can possibly have and take all that esteem and put it toward God. Amen. God wants to bless your life. I'm, I'm afraid that's more self-centered than we think. I think people have embraced the kind of gospel that doesn't allow for God to be the master he really is. But God is still going to be the master that he is, whether men receive it or not. And so I'm having to deal with that kind of audience, but I'm also having to deal with an audience of people. You know, when I looked into the scriptures, I found the first three examples, one of the most preeminent ones was, of course, <laughs> Abraham and his servant, that they were all good examples of a master and a servant. The servant wanting to do the will of a master. He goes out to get, to get a wife for Isaac, and he's praying and asking the Lord to bless and to help him. And, he's, and when it happens, he's thankful. And how does he thank God? I thank you for the goodness and kindness you bestowed upon my master, Abraham. He loved to be Abraham's servant. And Abraham loved to have him as a servant. Even contemplating, if need be, he would give his substance to the master, to his servant. He was going to do that. A good example. So what we have here, brother... And I'm going to get to this a little later. Is God being a master over us is a good thing. This is a good thing. See? And so I'm dealing with both of those. So please bear with me as I try to deal with both of these kinds of audiences. I know you're willing. And I know you love the Lord. And I know you know this, that he's a good master. And I'm, going to, I'm certainly going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. Okay? Now, the master is greater in this sense. See, he's the owner of the slave. He's the owner. Whenever Potiphar, whenever he bought Joseph, he owned Joseph. He did. Abraham owned his servant. He bought him. See? He bought him. He owned him. The master owns the servant. See? Because he's greater. Now, in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39 and 40, gave us a good example of this. By the way, God did say, behold, all souls are mine. He's master. Let me tell you why he's master, because this is really good. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39 and 40, this was actually a good provision for the people of Israel. Believe it or not, American audience, when God instituted slavery, it was a good thing. It was a good thing. I know there's a bad thing, but I also know there's a good thing in this. Perchance that one of the Israelites fell, maybe perchance their lands didn't yield and they didn't have any substance. God made a provision for them. Found in Leviticus chapter 25, 39 and 40. If thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee. How about that? He owned him. Thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant. Okay, so now let's look at the difference between ownership and ownership okay this ownership wasn't a permanent ownership like what happened to joseph when he was sold to potiphar that was intended to be a permanent ownership he became his slave permanently here it's more like i'm giving you this particular substance is worth this much and so you are going to give me this certain amount of time of work in order to provide for the substance i've given you since you needed it okay in other words you don't have what you need for livelihood I'm going to borrow to you. I'm going to give you of my substance because you don't have substance. You don't have it. You're the poor one. I'm the greater one. I've got the substance. I'm going to give you of my substance. Now you become mine and do service for me. That's the way it was. Remember when the prodigal son, he went out, wasted his substance? He says he joined himself to a citizen of that country. He bought him because he didn't have any substance for livelihood. He goes on to say, but thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, just kind of rigorous labor and permanently your servant. It's, it's not like that. But as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. 
Now, this is so important that we see this. One man is completely impoverished. Another man has the resources that that man needs. And so he gives him resources for his own livelihood. Okay? Now, take that generally and look at how this master in heaven is our master. Because we didn't have life, and he gave us of his life. We, brethren, I appreciate you, Brother Bob, for, get, for speaking about him being a creator because this was really helpful he is our master by virtue of being the creator that is every single human being on the face of this earth has an obligation to submit their entire lives to the living god believer or not and i think this needs to be told to people who don't know the lord yet because this is exactly what Paul did on Mars Hill. When he stood there on Mars Hill and spoke to those Athenians and philosophers, that is exactly what he said to them. Okay? And look at this, because this is so good. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. Well, he just passed right over that, because this is fundamental to the faith to see this. He made it. He owns it. Passed right over it. Dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeth he giveth to all life and breath and all things. You owe your service to him because he gave you life you didn't have. He gave it to you. So you have an obligation to seek him and to serve him. I appreciate, I appreciate the reasoning of the Apostle Paul. You know, all godly men throughout the history, they've like acknowledged this aspect of God as creator. Even though technically he formed Adam and then the rest came by birth. But look at how that's written up, because I think this is important to see. Look how that's written up in Genesis 2-7. Here's the Genesis of humanity. The Lord God formed, now he didn't say he formed the man. I'm thankful for the translators here. The Lord God formed a man. He means humanity as a whole. He formed the entire human race as a whole here at the beginning. He formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man, that's humanity, not just this man, but all men became a living soul. Not just Adam. He is involved, brother, in the creation of every human being. David said, thy hands have formed me and made me. See? You're where life came from. You're the source of it. I'm going to serve you as a result. I like this uh, provision in Exodus chapter 21, verse 4, because this highlights this too, of this servant that was coming to the end of his tenure with a master, and so he was going to go out. And you may recall that there were certain provisos about him going out, that if he came in by himself, he could go out by himself. If he came in with a wife and bore children, he could go out with his wife and children. If he came in with a wife. But if his master gave him a wife while he was that servant, remember what happened? The wife and the children are the masters. Who gave Adam his wife? then who do the children belong to? We are the children of that woman. Born to him who was a servant of God when he received his wife. See, we owe that to God. We owe it to the living God just by virtue of creation. He is the master. I'm glad for that thought. I'm glad. I'm thankful. We're owned by the Lord. We're his property. We're owned by him. And I'm glad for that. I'll get to this a little later, but now we're twice owned, brother. We're twice owned by our virtue of the death of Jesus Christ. But he, he owns us. This is why, brethren, this is why the rebellion, and I call it the rebellion of evolution, is so wrong. This is why it's so wrong. Because they attribute the source to something else so that they can do what they want to do. That's the bottom line of evolution. Because if we truly, brethren have come from somebody. We have borrowed life, which we do. 
from someone that is greater than we are, then we are subject to that someone. You have a master in heaven. Amen. Now, think of this. Because the master is greater, brother, and that means he does call the shots. Mm -hmm. He is greater than power because that's what a Lord is. He's, if a person is not greater than another, then he's not their Lord. That's what makes him Lord. That's what makes him master is he's greater in power, which means he does exercise dominion over his servants. He does do this. Proverbs says, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directs his steps. He makes his plans, but ultimately, God's deciding where he's going. Okay? That's, ultimately, that is what's going to happen. See? That's the way it works. All paths, brethren, we'll say it this way, all paths do lead to the judgment seat of Christ. Whether you fault him in this life or not, I'll tell you. Ultimately, God's will is the only one that will not be frustrated. God ultimately will not be frustrated with regard to his servants. He is ruling them. Whether it's the devil or principalities and powers of darkness or us. He does rule, okay? Scripture says that he rules in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. He's the ruler over it all, see? That gives us great encouragement when kingdoms are jostling. We know preeminently who's doing that. God's not up there wringing his hands going, how in the world am I going to get order out of this? He made it happen. He's over it because he is the master. He's the master. Now, there is a danger of provoking this master. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21 and 22, he tells the Corinthians, he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't. Not you shouldn't. You can't do this. You can't be partakers of the Lord's table and of table of devils. And then he says this, what weighty words these are. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Okay? Because if you get God angry, you become an adversary. Now, you're going to have to come into battle with him. Which one's stronger? Who's going to come out of that battle with their will being done? That's what he was telling the Corinthians. This truth had gotten away from the Corinthians. Don't let this truth get away from you, brother. He is the master in heaven. Amen. Huh? Our life is borrowed from him. Yeah. We owe him the service. Yeah. But if you are not willing to do this, we're dealing with an age of people that aren't. He's still going to get his will no matter what. Right. He's right. still going to because he is the Lord. Now, he says this. He says, he tells you in this exhortation to give unto your servants that which is just and equal. And I want to get on this. This is so good to see. Why does he say that? Because that's how he is. That's how he is. Isn't this a marvelous thing about salvation? That our ways do become his ways. And our thoughts do become his thoughts. So that our lives are actually conformed to his life. So that we're doing what he does. This is like what Peter said. He said, as he which called you is holy, so be ye holy. Now that's what he's saying here. I'm telling you to be just and equal because that's how I am. Amen. I'm just and equal as a master. Now think about this. God is just because he's righteous. He's righteous. The righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. That's what he is. That's what he is. John affirmed in 1 John 2, 29, he is righteous. That's what he is. Justness accentuates the judgment of God. In fact, we refer to judges as the justice of the peace. If God is just, then he's making judgments. That's how he is. And they're right judgments. Righteous are thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. They are. God is the judge of all. That's the one we've come to. He must judge. That is who he is. 
Abraham referred to God as the judge of all the earth. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? That's what he is. He's a judge. He loveth righteousness and judgment. He loves this because he is a judge. It is his nature to pronounce judgments on all things. Everything gets a judgment from God. Everything does. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou wicked servant. Very good. Hmm? O ye of little faith, I have not found thy works complete in my sight. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. God judges everything. Everything gets judged by God. Everything. Because he is a judge. No deeds among men shall go unjudged and unrewarded by the living God who is the judge. The Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. That's how he is. He knows exactly what's going on among men. He knows. That's how God is. See? What does it mean for God to be equal? It means for him to be impartial or unbiased in his judgment. Being in just proportion. See? Give unto your servants that which is right and in just proportion to the work they've given to you. That's being equal. God's judgments are never false, but according to truth. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. Yeah. All his judgments, yeah. they're truth. They're according to reality. Remember, remember Jesus said of him that he has the eyes like a flame of fire. Mm -hmm. See, he cuts through the appearances of things, and he judges it according to the reality of what it really is. Yeah. Men don't do this. They'll take a bribe and, and favor somebody who's evil. You can't trust the court systems in our land. I'm certain you know not to do that. Only if God makes them judge what is right, they do what's right. That's how it is. God is no respecter of persons. God will take no bribe to judge favorably for the wicked or ill favorably against the righteous. He'll not do this. It's good, brother. It's good when the wicked make a pronounce a bad judgment when you've done what is right to commit the keeping of your souls unto him in well-doing. Keep doing what's good. Because the God of heaven makes the ultimate judgment. Yes. In the day of judgment, brethren, God is going to overturn all kinds of judgments. Yes. Because he judges what is right. That's the way our God is. God will never favor a man who does what is evil. People have erected a view of salvation that lets God do something like this. God will never do something like that. Never. Ever. Ever. Well, I appreciated that meditation we had. Well, that was wonderful. God does not overlook sin, does not. He will not acquit the guilty. He will not do this. And he must have a sacrifice if he's going to justify the ungodly to make it right. See, God's righteous before he is anything else. There are times when God hasn't been merciful and hasn't been loving, but he's been righteous in everything that he's done, including mercy and love. He's righteous. Yea, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. He will not do this. He won't. He'll judge it according to what it is. That's the way our God is. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. That's how it is. That's how he looks at people. They're right or they're wicked. That's how he looks at them. That's how he judges. God judges the works of men according to their nature. And gives them a reward, a reward that suits the nature of their work. That's the way it is. That's how our God is. Now let's look at this for just a second. Now, these are words I'm going to give you. These are words that were spoken to the church because this can get away from people in the church. They can begin to think that because they're accepted in Christ that somehow they can have a wrong view of this. Think they've received <clears throat> special kinds of favor and not the kind of favor that we find in Christ Jesus. But that is not the case. This I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So you can't sow sparingly and reap bountifully. But you can't sow bountifully, you can't sow bountifully and not reap bountifully. Uh -huh. That's the way our God is. It's a marvelous thing he's done. This is the way it is. So much for equal meaning. Everybody kind of gets the same thing. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. If you give a little bit to God, you're going to get a little bit back. That's the way it works. I've learned this the hard way, brethren. Hard way. Times when I was, there was times when I was giving a little to God in my preaching. No wonder why I got so little back. God doesn't show favoritism. 
If you give a lot, you get a lot. That's how our God is. I, I'm glad it's this way. This is God being equal in judgment. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So what is that? That's equal. That's equal. If you're sowing to the flesh that's corrupt, you're going to get corruption. Yeah. That's what, see, God's telling us about how his judgments are. Amen. They're equal. They're equal. People think they can sow to the flesh and not reap corruption. Not going to happen. Because God's equal. Hmm? He judges the work according to his nature, and then he gives you back according to the nature of what you've done. That's the way our God is. <clears throat> with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. So for good or for evil, this is the way God is. See, if you're a merciful person, God will be merciful with you. Remember Jesus said that? He says, if you don't forgive men their sins, your heavenly Father won't forgive you. Now, this doesn't mean I'm going to go in and sin, but I'm going to be really merciful so that God will be really merciful to me. You know, you know that that's not at all what he's saying here. But he's saying how you dish it out to people, you're going to get it back by me. That's how it's going to come back to you. Okay? That's the way it is. If you're going to be froward, huh? you're going to be unyielding, then I'll be unyielding. You don't repent, I'll be unyielding. I'll just bring it harder. That's the way God is, see? And if you're pure, he'll show himself pure unto you. That's, that's our God. That's being equal. Mm -hmm. That's being equal. See, all men really work for God. Yeah, that's right. Ultimately, they do. Yeah. And every man's getting a wage. Mm -hmm. Every man. Hmm? They're getting a wage for their labor. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he had done, whether it be good or evil. Yeah. Okay? Now think of the truth of this thing as it is in Christ, and this will be my last point. Think of the, because in Christ, see, this is a marvelous reality of him being a master unto us and us being his servants. This is a good thing. You know, when men chart their own course, they always destroy themselves. They always do. Men have not been made to flourish under their own rule. They have been made to be subject to God's rule and direction. This is how it is, brother. We see it all the time. This is how it is. I know. Thank you, Brother Tony. I had this down, but this is a good one you gave me yesterday. He said, I know that the way of man is not in himself, is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Because when he tries to do this, he destroys his own life and people around him. That's the way it is. Pharaoh, when he wants to go his own way, Egypt gets destroyed as a result. Cain wants to go his own way, he wanders a vagabond on the earth and is cursed. That's the way it works. It's the way it works. Men want to chart their own course. You know, it was said of fallen humanity that they've gone, every man, to his own way. Now, how did that turn out for them? Pretty bad. Pretty bad. Truth fell in the streets, and they didn't have a single one among them that can make intercession before God because they went their own way. This master, him having a master in heaven is a very wonderful thing. It's a very wonderful thing. Now, think about the truth of this that as it is in Christ Jesus because I know you see this, that this is indeed a very good thing. It's amazing that men tend to be hard and cruel as masters themselves. And they want to charge God with cruelty as a master. But they're the ones that tend to be the cruel ones. Mm -hmm. This is how men tend to be in the flesh. If it wasn't this way, he wouldn't have given this exhortation. But this is how men tend to be, to be this way in the flesh, to be hard. So Pharaoh says, no straw, no straw. And you're given the same amount of bricks. And he made their lives absolutely bitter. That's the way men is. And when Saul is cruel among his people, he says, nobody eats. Nobody eats until I get vengeance on my enemies. Nobody. And so the people here, they're walking through this wooded area where honey has fallen that would give them the strength they need to fight harder. And they don't, they don't eat. Why? Because they're afraid. You know, men have this kind of a perception about God. And when you're in the assembly, you get the sense that you shouldn't be eating like it's unlawful to eat. Wrong. Honey falling on right? Nope. You can't have that. Jonathan says, my father's cursed the land. That's what he's, he's cursed the people. That's what he's done. He's cursed them. 
Men tend to be cruel and hard. But God is not this way. Now, Jesus is, in fact, greater than all. He is. God's given him the preeminence, so he's the master. God has put him in this place. He has made him both Lord and Christ. He's done this. See? And we are his possession by virtue of death. We are. Remember what Paul told those elders there in Ephesus? He said to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. We're actually twice bought. We're twice bought by the Lord. We were his by creation, and we are now his through the death of Jesus Christ. See, you can't really look at the death of Christ with, with, good, with true perception and not serve God. You can't do that. If people are not serving God, it's because they don't understand the death of Jesus Christ. I assure you that is true. That is a faithful saying. Okay, you may tend to, th well, no, I know you, brethren, don't. But others may tend to think people got a handle on the death of Christ because it's such a fundamental thing. No, fundamental doesn't mean it's simple. It's not simple. And if people aren't really serving God with their whole heart, they don't understand the death of Jesus Christ. They don't realize that we are his purchased possession, and we're glad to have it so. We're glad to have it so. God takes care of what belongs to him, and we do, but in fact, belong to him. Now, look at the beneficial rule of Jesus Christ. It is said in the scriptures that he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his fullness, which, oh, sorry, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So here's what Jesus does with his power. He takes his greatness and he makes his people great. That's what he does. He fills them with what he has. See? So that if he's the vine, you're the branches, and you abide in him, you'll bear fruit. That's the way it is. See? That's how he is. He's a good master. He is to us. It is a blessing and a benefit, brethren, to be in Christ and to have him as master. Mm -hmm. Now think about this, because I know this is a difficulty for people out there. People don't understand that salvation is just and that it's right. That what God has done is right, okay? And I'll end on this point. How can we stand before a judge that is just and equal and at the same time obtain favor? Because this is so, so essential. How can you do that? How can he put you in the balances and you come out equal? How can it be that way? How can he maintain justice? Because I think people think that somehow God has denied himself to save them by some of the things that they say. Thank God we're not under the law anymore. God doesn't judge like that. God's not like that anymore. God's not a God of wrath anymore. He's got a love. People say things like this. They lead me to think they don't understand that God hasn't changed at all. What he's done is made it right to be merciful and gracious to us and to save us. See, salvation, what Jesus has done has made what God is doing right in salvation. That's the thing that is so important to be seen. For one thing, see, faith in Christ is the means by which righteousness is imputed to you. It's the means. See, that man is a blessed man to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Not just Abraham. All of us, all of us, if you believe your faith in Christ, your trusting in him is counted for righteousness, see? So you are right before him. There's nobody that believes in the name of Jesus Christ that isn't righteous. They are righteous, see? I say that because there are people that believe in the name of Christ, but they don't know that they're righteous. His faith was counted for righteousness, that's a marvelous truth. See, we stand before God fundamentally by faith. <laughs> by faith. See, sins have been paid for, which means forgiveness is just and right. Remember when Kenny Smith said this? He was one of the first ones that, 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 that I saw this clearly. This was a marvelous thing. Because somehow I had gotten in my mind kind of a variant idea between the justice and the forgiveness of God. I hadn't seen that righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Hadn't seen that. Let me ask you, do you want, do you really want God to deal with you justly and faithfully? Indeed you do. Indeed you do. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. See, when he forgives men, it's, an, it's a just thing to do. Because yeah. it's been paid for. It's been paid for. 
See, it's right. It's right. We can stand before him. And this truth, brethren, in Christ, you really are righteous by nature. We're not trying to be righteous. You really are. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Not he ought to be. He is. He is a new creation. See? And a man, brethren, who walks by faith in Christ will do righteousness. Not he ought to. He will. He will do it. Okay? And I like this text, and this has always been a great conversion text, but this is an ongoing principle in the kingdom of God, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's not just his entrance. His continually believing is unto righteousness. It's unto righteousness, see? That's the way it is. I mean, you didn't confess Jesus once, did you? We still confess him. And we still walk by faith in him. And it's unto righteousness. See, it's unto it. And so this is a marvelous thing God has done, that salvation is just and right, no matter how you look at it, so that he can be the master in heaven, and he can be just and equal, and he will extend favor to those that walk by faith in Christ Jesus and will ultimately judge those that don't because he's the master in heaven. So I encourage you, brethren, with these things. At some point, you will play the role of a master. Master doesn't just mean you own people. It means you're greater. Maybe you've got greater insights, and so you're going to lead somebody in that kind of a capacity to help them along, see? Or maybe it has to do with substance. You've got more substance than someone else, and now you're going to... You're going to give and adjust in a, in a fair way to someone else. Or maybe you're a supervisor or some kind of a ruler over somebody. But in whatever way, you have some kind of a mastery over people. And all of you are doing in it, remember this, knowing that you have a master in heaven. Thank you, brother.